has set you free. You are free indeed. Let's try that one more time. If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Aren't you thankful for that truth today? Aren't you thankful that it is true today? This undeniable reality that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus sets a person free, when Jesus sets you free, when Jesus sets me free, church, we are free indeed. And remember, this is true no matter your outward circumstance or situation. We can be free while we are walking through the valley. We can be free while going through the trials. Boy, we're getting quiet on this already. Come on. We can be free when it feels like our world is upside down. Our freedom in Jesus Christ means that we are no longer slaves to sin, or I'll say it this way, that sin no longer has mastery over those who Jesus has delivered. That ought to give a, a, a huge hallelujah in this place. That we are no longer slaves to sin. That that old way of life, those things that were bringing us down, those chains that were holding us down, that were binding us, those strongholds, those spiritual strongholds in life that were separating us from the presence of our Heavenly Father, those things have been done away with. Jesus Christ has saved you, has delivered you, has set you free today. Our freedom in Christ is gained through salvation, as we have been talking about. It is maintained through obedience. We know that our deliverance comes through Jesus and discipleship is key to living in continued freedom today. This morning we wrap up this mini-series within the series that we have called Living in Continued Freedom. This is part three of, of that sermon. The last two sermons talked about significant and dangerous signs in our lives that show we have allowed the enemy access to our lives. These signs help us realize that somehow and somewhere the enemy was given a foothold in our life that has now turned into a stronghold in our life. And I don't know about you, but I know what it's like to wrestle with a stronghold spiritually. Is there anybody else that would testify and be vulnerable and saying, you know what, Pastor, I know what you're talking about. I've been there. Anybody else? Raise your hand up. What it feels like to wrestle with that spiritual stronghold. The first sign that we talked about two weeks ago was continued iniquity. Continued sin. Ongoing, repetitive sin in our lives. Church, listen to me. This is more than just a bad habit, it is spiritual demise. It is knowingly rebelling against the instruction of our God. Such outward behavior points to an inward spiritual problem. If we have continued sin, habitual sin in our lives, we ought to take a step back and look at the root, what is causing that, and ask Jesus to help us with that problem. Because here's the cool part. You may be wrestling with this for 10, 20, 30 years, however many, maybe it's just a couple of months, whatever. And maybe you have found yourself in a position where you are unable to break free from that problem. Here's a news flash for us all today. None of us have the ability to set ourselves free from sin. We need a deliverer. Hello? We need a Savior. And that is why, hear me, until you call on the name of Jesus, and this might seem harsh, just bear with me, but that is why until a person makes that decision, they are going to continue to wrestle with that spiritual problem. Because true freedom is found only in Jesus Christ. 
today. I will testify of that just in my own life. It wasn't until I called on the name of the Lord that suddenly those strongholds came tumbling down. Number two, we talked about a sign of continued illness. Now, I want to be careful again as we approach this. All illness in life is an indirect result of sin in general, but we understand and we talked about last week there can be illness in our life that is a direct result of sin or spiritual oppression. The enemy can attack you through an illness that you might be experiencing, and he can also attack you with an illness if he has access to your life. In either case, Jesus can and will set you free in either situation through the healing of your body or through the outpouring of his love and grace. Church, his grace is sufficient for us today. Now this morning we're going to move away from the signs and we're going to move toward a topic of standing against the enemy. So far the two signs we have talked about have dealt with more of kind of cleaning house. Anybody ever have those moments when you kind of step back and you, you look at your home and you realize, you know what, we just need a good Friday or Saturday where we just clean house. Ever been there? I mean, we, you know, throughout the week, the dishes get done, the laundry gets done, but you begin to notice maybe some extra clutter in the corners or you see the dust beginning to fall, where you just got to stop and take a few extra hours and really kind of deep clean. How many know what I'm... I'm talking about. That's kind of where we've been the last two weeks. But today, we're going to talk about uh, uh, taking steps to make sure that the enemy doesn't gain access to our lives in the first place. We're going to do this by studying the enemy just a little bit and understanding his tactics. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he said, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. If we read the Word of God, we know that the Word of God has given us insight as to who the enemy is, what he has come to do, and how he does what he does. Now this sermon is not given to glorify the works of the devil. That's not what we're here to do today, or to make him appear bigger and more mighty than what he really is. However, church, listen to me clearly, I hope that this message today helps us to develop a healthy respect toward the enemy and the spiritual danger that he truly is. And somebody might rear back and say, Satan, you mean we're supposed to respect the devil? Just hear me out for just a moment. As we have stated before, we are going to war with the enemy. As the old song says, We are going to his camp to take back what he has stolen from us. Anybody remember that song? In this battle, we need to respect our enemy. What I mean by that is when a soldier goes to war, a good soldier respects the strength of the army that he or she is fighting against. They don't go to the front line carrying a water pistol. Well, Pastor, now you're just being silly. They arm themselves with the weaponry necessary to get the job done. What is the job? To win the day. But here's the problem, church. I often see believers, men and women of God, who would go to the front line unprepared for what they're going to face on that front line. Never forget there is a very real enemy out there that looks to destroy you today. Just as there is God's presence in this house that is here to uplift you, to encourage you, and to empower you, there is a foe named Satan who is very real, who is not a joke, who wants to destroy your life today. Some of us are losing the day because we are going to battle unprepared. We are going to the front line not ready to fight. Respecting the devil means we understand that the enemy is very serious in his approach. The enemy is very real. And part of respecting the enemy is choosing not to pretend that he doesn't have a strong ability to wreck people's lives. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. And he comes to destroy. John 10.10 makes that clear. He is a very serious threat, and church, he's good at what he does. But how many know today that our God is greater? 
I just want to throw that out there. We know today that Jesus has come that we might have life and life to the full or life more abundantly. Here's the deal. We're going to look at a well-known passage of Scripture this morning that I believe will help us to highlight the motive of our God and the motive of the enemy. We're going to look at a passage that I'm sure many of us know, Psalm 23. It's a well-known passage that begins by describing God as a what? Shepherd. As someone who cares for us. It describes Him as a shepherd. It identifies our Heavenly Father as one who is looking over and protecting and providing for those under His care. It outlines some amazing things that God does for us. For instance, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, I find this terminology kind of interesting. He makes me. It doesn't say that he suggests that I do. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. These are all amazing things, amen? Amen. But then we come upon a verse that moves us from the green pastures. It moves us from the still waters. It moves us from the the, the place of refreshment and so on into where? A valley. Not just any valley. The Bible doesn't label this valley as the, the valley of rainbows and butterflies. It doesn't label the valley as, as you know, unicorns and daisies or whatever. It labels the valley the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death. The NIV says it this way in verse 4, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I want you to notice something very quickly in this. His his statement of I will fear no evil is a choice, number one. Why? What is the basis for that choice? Because he knows that God is with him. The King James says it this way, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The psalmist makes clear that God's presence never departs from him though he finds himself in the valley. And it's this moment, this particular passage that I want us to pay close attention to to this morning. Here's the deal. This is what I want us to understand. God wants to lead you through the valley. Somebody said, well, that's, that's... Duh, pastor, it's simple. I want you to hear it again. God wants to lead you, emphasis right here, through the valley. And with every step you take, His rod and His staff are there to protect you and to provide for you. However, the enemy wants to get you stuck in the valley. He doesn't want you going through. He wants the valley to be the end of you. It's in the valley where the enemy will strike the hardest and the fiercest. How many know what I'm talking about? Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? On those days when things just don't line up right. On those days where your mind is trying to take you to darker places where things are just, it just seems like everything's going wrong. That's when the enemy's voice often is the loudest, trying to convince you, trying to lead you his way, and trying to make you forget that even with all of this going on, God's rod and staff are there to provide and to protect for you. God's presence is with you through this situation. It is in the valley when fear and worry and other temptations may arise. It is in the valley where we will have to make an important, uh, an important decision. Listen to me, going to Brooklyn there for just a minute. It is in the valley where we will still have to make an important decision. Will I stick with the shepherd 
or get stuck in the valley? Will I stick with the shepherd or get stuck in the valley? The moment you begin to downplay the valley, church, is the moment you begin to let your guard down. The valley itself is not the enemy, but it is a territory or a situation where the enemy can use for his benefit. The enemy will do what he can to take full advantage of those moments to attack you and to bring you down. And this is not in any way, shape, or form a message that says God is not good enough to get us through. In fact, it's quite the opposite. God is the only one good enough to get us through. The problem is our downplayed approach to the enemy. That downplayed approach will create a lack of dependency upon the shepherd. And too often, church, as we reach those points in the valley, I've seen too many brothers and sisters who, instead of following the shepherd, begin to follow their own logic and reasoning that would tell them, hey, you know what? I got this. Yeah, things are I I got this. I I know what to do. I know where to go. I know what to say. I know who to consult. Come on. I got this. I got this. And instead of taking that moment seriously and maybe taking some things to the Lord in prayer, we take it on ourselves and then we find ourselves stuck. Are you with me today? Come on, are you with me today? This can be true on the mountaintop or in the valley. No matter where we find ourselves today, I pray that we are fully dependent on God and that we understand the real danger that the enemy is to our lives and to our spiritual Freedom. So very quickly, we're going to look at three things that help us to be more dependent on God. Three things that will help us uh, keep in, in step with the shepherd so that we don't get stuck in the valley. Two of these three highlight ways in which the enemy tries to attack us, ways in which the enemy tries to get us stuck in those situations. But the central truth to all three points is this. God's presence or the presence of the shepherd is essential in making any of this happen. Again, we cannot do this without his help. So number one, we've got to recognize the danger zones. And suddenly a certain theme song started playing in everybody's head. Sorry. What kind of danger zones am I talking about this morning? I'm talking about the kinds that are traps. The kind that are designed to lure you in and to get you stuck in the valley. I want to be cautious with this next question. But many of you are, just just quick survey, how many have ever found yourself in a position or in a place, a time, when you didn't feel safe? Maybe you found yourself in the bad part of town. Maybe you found yourself driving in a heavy, uh, a heavy rainstorm or a, uh, a snowstorm. I won't ever forget just a couple of years ago, or yeah, a hailstorm. We were coming home from, from Woodston, and uh, it, was, it was in the days right after camp, and so we were making several trips back and forth to the campground, and, and I had... Uh, three of my kiddos with me in my pickup truck and a storm you could see uh, uh, a storm brewing on the in the west and, and sure enough before we got home this thing this thing hit well it was right where we were going by the reservoir there south of, of Kerwin and this was a very electrified storm in fact I can honestly say I have never in all my day seen anything like it we're down in that, that, that river bottom. The, the, the dam is on our left. How many know what I'm talking about? And you cross that bridge that takes you over the stream, and you're kind of in that valley area. And I'll never forget watching strike after strike so close to the highway you could see the fireball rising up off the ground. And each set, or with each strike came a, a clap of thunder that sounded like we had a cannon in the back of my pickup. And I could hear my kids getting nervous in the back seat. And finally, as we're, we're going, there's a radio tower there that's on the right side as you're 
driving through that. And I mean, that radio tower got lit up. Boom, boom. I mean, right as we're driving by this thing. And I think it was Samuel, if I'm not mistaken. Sammy, do you remember this day? Asking how safe we were in the truck. With the lightning literally dancing. I've never seen anything like this. I, I've seen a close lightning strike before, but not repetitive like that. Just boom, 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 boom. And with, with that fatherly, confident voice, while I'm white-knuckling the steering wheel, thinking, Jesus, we don't want to die today. We're okay, kids. We're going to make it through the valley. I didn't feel safe. <laughs> Newsflash, Sam, just in case you couldn't tell by the shakiness in your father's voice that day. We know what those moments feel like. Moments when your heart is pounding and you wished you weren't there. But these aren't necessarily the danger zones that I'm talking of. Yes, these can be dangerous situations, but I'm talking about the danger zones that have the potential to destroy you spiritually. Maybe it's a moment that you have alone in the house before anyone else is there. It's just you, your computer, and the internet. Maybe it's a conversation in the coffee shop with a friend who hears you out and is emotionally supportive. Maybe it's the credit card that enables your impulsive buying that gives you a thrill or a sense of comfort. Maybe it's the things you consume to take the edge off, the music you listen to that distracts you for a moment, or the books you read to help you escape. One story I was reading this week of a pastor who was also an author, he spoke of his danger zone being the hotel room when he was alone. And so he set up an accountability system with his wife that any time he began to feel that temptation rise up, he would call his wife and they would work through it. Here's the deal, guys. Danger zones are those areas in life that the enemy will use to try to get us stuck in the valley. And I get it. We may not all share the same temptations in this room this morning, but we know what temptation is. Amen. And we know what it feels like. So if, here, here's, here's the idea. If you know that it's going to be a potential problem, then choose to have nothing to do with that particular danger. If that computer is a gateway for material you shouldn't be viewing, then church, get rid of the computer. Amen. But pastor, I, I got to have it for work. I got to have it for email. I got to have it for all these different things. You know what? That's not going to cut it with God. We can make excuses for sin all day long, church. It's not going to cut it with God. Get rid of the computer. In college, I had a friend that struggled with this, this particular situation. And one day, God really was, was, was hitting him hard in our chapel service. And so he brings me his power cord to his computer. And he says, I need somebody to help me. I need somebody to, 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 to assist me with, with this problem. He says, would you be my accountability partner? He says, here's the power cord to my computer. He says, the only time that I'm going to give myself permission to be on that computer is if you are in that room with me. And I had a crazy work schedule when I was in college, which meant I wasn't back to the dorm till usually 11.30 or midnight. But to help him out, we would study together in his room, and I, would, I was the keeper of the power cord. If it's causing sin, if it's a gateway to sin, it's not worth your soul. Amen. If that conversation is moving you in ways that you know are compromising, then get rid of that relationship. If that credit card feeds the impulse to spend more than you have, then cut that thing up. Are you following me today? In the case of the pastor, I already mentioned this, he set up an accountability system with his wife to make sure he didn't fall for that trap. In the case of my life, Somebody might say, Pastor, wait a minute, time out. No, hear me. I have an internet policy for my life, and I've stated this from the pulpit before. I'm going to restate it again today. Every single one of my internet-capable devices my wife has absolute full access to. My board knows that they can come and check the history on my computer in my office, at my home, on my iPad, on my cell phone, at any time they want to unannounced. 
Why do I do that? Because I don't want that to become a problem in my life. Are you hearing me today? Every single text message that I send or email message, I read and then reread to make sure that it cannot be misconstrued for something else. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? I might have a message that goes out to uh, 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 maybe Donna, Donna, hypothetical. It's talking about maybe uh, uh, a, a meeting that we're going to be having with, with her family and my family. And instead of just keeping it general, we'll see you tonight. I make sure to fill in the blanks so that somebody else can't come in there and say, oh, wait a minute, what is this? We'll see you tonight business. How many know what I'm talking about? Making sure that we don't give the room or the enemy an inch to move in these areas of our life. We've got to guard ourselves against the danger zones. Danger zones are those areas in life. They're baited traps that the enemy throws out in front of us. Recognize the trap for what it is and steer clear of that trap. James chapter 1, verse 13 tells us this regarding temptation. When tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me, for God uh, cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Dragged away! Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to what? The enemy will play on your fleshly desires, church. He did this to Jesus in the wilderness, and he's going to do it to you as well. Pastor, what are you talking about? After Jesus had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, what's the first thing that the enemy tries to tempt him with? Food. He tries to go to Jesus' physical comfort. The enemy will play on your fleshly desires. And if that enticement is not recognized for what it is, a person can be dragged down by that temptation and it leads to sin, which then gives birth to death. Bam! The trap slams shut and the damage is done. Therefore, we must see the danger zones for what they are and deal with them accordingly. Number two, we need to realize the presence of wolves. We need to realize the presence of wolves. And this point is similar to the last one, but I want you to see something very important. The Lord is our shepherd. Amen? And He protects us from the wolf who is the enemy. God is and always will be watching over His flock. But the enemy is lurking, waiting for the opportunity uh, to, to come and to strike. The enemy often does so through wolves who look to bring harm to the people of God. Now again, for the point of clarity, we know that our enemy is not flesh and blood. However, the enemy can use people through his influence to bring devastation to hearts and lives. Jesus warned of such people in his sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 7. He said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ferocious wolves. Also consider passages such as Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 27. Her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. At this time in biblical history, the writers were describing leaders of Israel who were under the influence of demons. And this description of those leaders revealed destructive, bloodthirsty predators. And that is exactly who the enemy is. Destructive, vicious, bloodthirsty, looking to bring destruction to your life. And I find the illustration of the wolf in Scripture very, very intriguing. Why? Because this particular animal has a really interesting way of hunting. In recent U.S. history, ranchers in the northwest part of the nation They've been kind of wrapped up in a controversy dealing with actual wolves. In decades past, wolves were seen only as predators in these regions and they were systematically dealt with until their population had become extremely limited. But today, in modern times, there has been an effort to repopulate the species through the relocation of the animals. In other words, the wolves are being brought back. 
Now, this sounds innocent enough, right? One rancher describes the situation a different way. He says that wolves are predators and will always be predators. And with the animals now reintroduced, the ranchers can't let their kids play in their own backyards. Their herds are constantly attacked. The people cannot take walks without having a weapon for protection. In other words, these wolves are real danger. Now, I want you to see what also this study said on wolves and what one researcher brings to light in this situation. This is what he says. I love this. The Lord did not teach us about predators to teach animal control or children's fables. Wolves and sheep cannot coexist. How many just had a huge like light bulb moment? Bing, right? Wolves and their food cannot coexist. When wolves, watch this, I found this fascinating. When wolves appear most casual and innocent, even interesting to watch, they are actually studying you and sizing up their next prey for attack. The, most, or the, the more indifferent they seem, the more serious the danger. They are preparing for that pack attack. The more comfortable they appear, the more deadly they are. Now, I'm not here to debate on the topic of animal protections or species eliminations or any of that kind of stuff. That's not the point. What I want us to understand this morning is when we see a spiritual wolf beginning to lurk or to prowl, don't get comfortable with the presence. Are you hearing me today? Don't get comfortable with the presence of that wolf. And it might be hard for us to, to understand where I'm going, but just watch this. Maybe you have that friend that's doing nothing but speaking discouragement to your life. Maybe you have those those social media accounts where, where you can throw out this, this, this stuff and people will just feed. Listen to me. When the wolves are present, they are, they are basically, not basically, they are looking for ways to attack. And the enemy will use those avenues to bring you down. The point is simple. We've got to watch out for these wolves. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us that we need to be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, he uses a different animal in this this particular situation, he says that your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Church, listen to me. The enemy is not some cartoonish figure with little horns and a red tail or a little imp that appears on your shoulders and trying to do these things. We've got to start treating the enemy for who he is, for the serious spiritual threat that he is. We've got to start coming to battle prepared. Not just today, but every single day. If I could have the worship team... Re- come back to the stage it brings me to point number three number one we've got to be aware of the danger zones number two we've got to realize the presence or beware of the presence of wolves and the answer that all of this number three is we've got to run to the shepherd we've got to run to the shepherd the shepherd is the only source of our freedom from the valley the shepherd is the only one who can deliver us from the situation that would otherwise destroy us And even though we might find ourselves in the valley, church, listen to me, and I hope you hear these words clearly. I don't know where you might be today. You might be on the mountaintop high. You might be in the valley low. But listen to me, even if you find yourself in the middle of that valley, the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, can I tell you something? God has the power to carry you through today. With God as your shepherd, that valley will not overtake you. It will not. But some today have been listening to the lies of the enemy. Oh, you'll never make it through. Oh, you're not good enough. Your resources are too limited. You might as well just give up right here, right now. And give in to those fleshly impulses. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. God has the power to carry you through. Do you believe that? Three of us. Come on, do you believe that today? Because it makes a big difference. 
When we find ourselves wrapped up in the trap of temptation, when we find ourselves being, being picked on and preyed upon by the wolves, do we find ourselves then running to the shepherd or do we find ourselves coming to that battle with a water pistol? I got this. No, 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 no. God wants to arm you with like an Abrams tank, you know, with the 50 cal on top. Nobody else? Okay, whatever. Come on! Are you going to war prepared today? Are you willing to engage and to overcome? Hello? Are you willing to run to the shepherd? There's one more verse and then we're going to pray. I want you to see something. As long as you remain with the shepherd, the danger zones, listen to me, they will have no power over you. As long as you remain in the shepherd, the wolves cannot overtake you. Here's what I want you to realize. It out of, uh, uh, oh goodness, I just, there it is. John chapter 10, verse 11. I want you to na- understand exactly who the shepherd is. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep his rod and his staff church they comfort us his rod and his staff are there to protect us and to provide for us his son Jesus gave his life to deliver us today are you ready to run to the shepherd I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes across this place Maybe you have found yourself stuck in a trap. Maybe one of those danger zones was set. You took the bait and there you are. Or maybe it's a situation dealing with wolves. You have allowed for the presence of wolves in your life, be it coming through media or people or whatever, wherever that's coming from. You recognize today that you have allowed the wrong voices to be speaking to you. You have allowed the wrong influences to be active in your life. And today is a day of deliverance for you. This moment is a day where God wants to set you free. He wants to break the chains of that trap and he wants to shut down the voices and the impact of those wolves on your life but you've got to make the choice to run to the shepherd right now right now